last time we dipped our pinky toenail tiny bit into Hamlet, talking about Act One, Scene One. And I hope I uh, gave you a rough idea of how to get through it. Act One, Scene One, for me personally, has always been a challenge to get through of any Shakespeare play, because that's the play where I start, well, that's the scene, any of the plays, where I start reading and I have to remind myself, like, uh, what the hell is going on here? Because, you know, this is the first work that we are reading that is not translated. And that's a challenge, because we're not reading a different language, it's English, but it is English of, um, let's say, a very early variety. It is technically modern English, but, uh, you know, Bear Bodkin. Uh, nobody, nobody speaks like this. At least nobody who doesn't get beat up on a daily basis. So the opportunity to go in and just get smacked in the face by Shakespeare is, uh, I find, a persistent phenomenon of Act 1, Scene 1, regardless of the play. It takes me a while to get into it. So by going through it last time, I'm hoping we had some sense of um, the basic rhythms of what he's doing. And I tried to point out how, the, uh, how he's handling certain things and how certain stylistic choices he's making uh, are not accidental. It's very easy to just say, well, this doesn't make any sense. When, in fact, it makes a lot of sense, you just have to figure out what that sense is. Remember, you know, the seemingly throwaway first line of Shakespeare is always a puzzle to be unwrapped. That's a mixed metaphor. You don't unwrap puzzles. Well, I guess I, you know, if it's a present. Uh... Who's there? The very first line. And my contention, and it's really not mine, I'm stealing it. My contention is that who's there is the hint to the whole thing. So it's like starting a murder mystery where the first line of uh, the book is, the butler did it. It sort of takes the fun out of it, you could say. It's giving you the preview of everything to come, but really, you don't understand it at first. And it's only over time that things start to unfold themselves. I also want you to, don't mind me, there we go, to remember this young lady. Um... Da Vinci was a little earlier than Shakespeare, but he was also in Italy. So they were always kind of on the cutting edge of that Renaissance stuff. So <clears throat> you can almost look at them as contemporaries in a way. But what I really want you to focus on, we talked about some of this stuff about this painting in the past. Look at those eyes. Look at that smile. What the hell is she thinking about? She's thinking something. That's a look I get from my wife occasionally when I know I should be guessing what she's thinking. <laughs> uh, it's rich. What's she thinking? And it guesses. Yeah. It's a mystery. It's a brick wall. You don't know. Now, there's a couple of things you can take away from this. Number one, you are all at this moment qualified to sit down and write an expansive academic paper or even a book about what's going through her mind. Because nobody knows. You are as much of an expert 
as somebody with three PhDs in art history. Not only is it a mystery what she's thinking, however, but just think about the scope. And this is really what I want to have in the back of your head today. The scope of what she's thinking. Is there any limit? Once you open that door and start to look inside that mind, start teasing out those thoughts one by one, do you think you'll find a simple answer? A simple thing where you can walk away and say, yep, yeah, that's what she had on her mind. Clearly, grocery list. She's headed to the market. She's thinking, got to get the eggs, the milk. Friends coming over for dinner on Sunday night. I got to make something special. <clears throat> the produce isn't very good at the one market. I'll have to go to a second. No. I look at this. Again, just me. I'm an idiot. What do I know? I look at this. If she were to start telling me what she's thinking, it would go on forever. It is limitless. This is around the same time in history that historians have come to call the age of discovery. Columbus sails to the New World, Magellan sails around the world, colonies start po popping up all through the Americas. Discovery. We had set goals to cross the Atlantic. We set goals to circumnavigate the entire globe, and we did it. No more vague wonderings. Hey, what's over there? Uh, we know. We've done it. Not so direct there, not so finite, not so simple. I'm not saying that circumnavigating the globe is simple, but it's simpler than this. The human mind for the Renaissance is infinite. Nobody had really thought in those terms before. The human mind is a mystery, but because it was so vast, because the thoughts of humanity are so rich with potential, people also thought, well, if it's so vast, that must mean we're pretty smart. If we're pretty smart. We can unfold it. We can figure out all the mysteries. Reason. Reason is the key to the mystery. All we got to do, all we got to do is think hard enough. Keep disappearing into those thoughts. And we'll get to the goody at the end of the line. We will find our answers. The little maze will have a little piece of cheese at the end of it that we can reach. All we gotta do is try hard enough. So, what's she thinking?
coffee. Oh, no. There we go. Um, okay. Just a reminder also, um, now that I turned on the lights, you can't see anything. Yeah, you really can't see this at all. Uh, Globe Theater, Bear Stage, Daylight, Summertime, Lots of Noise, uh, the people in what would be considered the cheap seats then were right up front at the stage. They were the, uh, the rowdy ones. Technically, they weren't seats. They could stand there. They're the ones who are talking back to the stage, calling out. It's like Showtime at the Apollo, for God's sake. It was, it was a rough crowd. The theater is always dynamic. The theater is a... Uh, <laughs> A place of great chaos and possibilities. Uh, not unlike the human mind. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go over, I want to take a look at scene two, since we're just flying through this stuff. And then we'll start with some oral presentations and work our way a little bit more expeditiously through the um, rest of the play. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let me see something, actually. It is too bright. There we go. Okay, Globe Theater, bare stage, broad daylight, nothing there. Everything needs to be done through the words. <coughs> Flourish, enter Claudius, king of Denmark, Gertrude the queen, Hamlet, Polonius, Laertes, the sister of Ophelia, Voltamine, Barnelius, Lord's attendant. That's it. That is the stage direction. Everything else has to happen through the language. You can do certain things with staging, where you place the actors, although at this stage there weren't officially directors in theater yet. Um, but it is, Shakespeare is primarily a, uh, an artist of language. Claudius! What do we think of Claudius? Don't jump ahead, either. I think he's kind of true <laughs> to his test brother because he used to have the kingdom before him and uh, he loved his dead brother's wife and he know that he is not as good as his test brother since Maybe his brother is loved by others, his good appearance, but he's not. Yeah. Okay. Um, couple things. Yes, obviously, he has some issues with his brother. Um, we'll get to that. Kind of reminds me of um, uh, Agamemnon, when we're talking about uh, what we're doing now. Uh, the Iliad? Iliad, yeah. Like, How so? Um, kind of just that, like, dynamic of, like, he is, you know, Agamemnon was the king, right? He was in charge, but there was kind of a weird, like, his power struggle between him and Achilles because he was the warrior that was beloved, that was fighting in the trenches, so he had to kind of, like, prove, like, yeah, I'm in charge. And it kind of seems similar to how Claudius is kind of, like you say, his brother was kind of beloved, Hamlet is beloved. Even though he's in power, he is consistent and constantly trying to, like, yeah. Who's that? He's the one that's the king. He's, uh, he's in a naturally um, questionable position. The uh, Well, you can look at this a couple of different ways. You can think of it just in strict guy terms of he is in an eternal 
pissing contest with the other uh, alpha dogs on the on the block. But uh, for Shakespeare, it's actually a little bit more contextual than that because remember the cheap seats. They understand the pissing contest. They understand yeah. that, and you can play on that a little. Uh, the more refined seats, perhaps, you know, the balconies, where they'll go and sit and have a nice little picnic and, you know, try and ignore the rebel. Um, they might have a little bit more of a refined sensibility. And what they're really reading there Legitimacy. The question of legitimacy. Who is a legitimate king? Does he have the right to rule? Should he be, would he, would somebody else be a better king? Perhaps. Certainly we saw that in Genji, the idea that, well, you know, who is in power is often kind of accidental, whereas if you consult you know, the official historians of any era, they will all say, well, of course, our king, our emperor, our czar, whatever, of course he was king because he was the best. Uh, not necessarily. Legitimacy goes to the historical context of uh, England at the time. England at the time that this was written was in the late stages of, well, we're not quite sure exactly when it was written, but it's generally pegged as in the last decade or so of Queen Elizabeth, who came to the throne after kind of a messy little falling out with her sister. Her father was Henry VIII. He famously broke away from the Catholic Church and started his own church with himself at the head, which is a cool thing to do. Do it like a boss. Um, he went through, I believe, six wives trying to find one who would give him a male heir. He finally got one. Uh, he became king for, I think, two years and then died. Little brat. Um, and then it went to his daughter, his eldest daughter, Mary who was a Catholic and reverted England back to the Catholic tradition. Mary got kicked out. Elizabeth rises to the throne under questionable circumstances. And Elizabeth, once again, takes the country back to the Protestant Anglican tradition of her father. Legitimacy, who has the right to rule, is at the heart of just about everything that Shakespeare wrote. And he's usually trying to justify the kings in power. Macbeth is one of the best ones to read for that because that was after King James came to the throne after, um, uh, after Elizabeth died. And Macbeth, while being one of the greatest plays ever written, is also a shameless bootlicking job for the new monarch. Great play. Um, but anyway, not to get too far ahead. So was he, is Shakespeare not so overtly, obviously, overly kind of like a, this art is also a, a, a mirror of what's going on in real life politics in the way that Dante did, or just not as obvious. Shakespeare is more of a mystery than Dante. Shakespeare was more commercially minded than Dante, Shakespeare was more of a personal uh, blank than Dante. We probably know more about Dante than we do about Shakespeare as a, as a man. Shakespeare we know practically nothing. We know roughly when he was born, we know when he died, we know a few financial transactions he made in between. Uh, that's pretty much it. In hard facts, go seek out biographies of Shakespeare, and they tend to be in the fiction section, because nobody knows anything beyond those facts. 
And let's face it, would you really pay $24 for a hardcover of what I just told you in 15 seconds? Probably not. Maybe if I put in some good pictures. Claudius! I'm getting back there. Claudius! We know all this stuff about him. We know that he is uh, a troubled individual. But I don't want to go there just yet. You see this entrance flourish, which means trumpets blare. Da, 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 da. Enter all of these people. This is a pretty good crowd of people. And you can see, you know, Lord's attendant, they can really flesh that out with some, you know, some backhand, backstage guys who, yeah, just put on this robe and go stand out there and it'll look impressive. Because when people walk in with a big entourage, it looks impressive. That's the whole point of an entourage. And he is the first one to talk, and he gets this long speech. So without knowing anything, you're immediately told, okay, this is the king. This is the guy. We've heard some stuff in Act 1 setting up like, oh, okay, you know, the old king is dead, the new king is uh, uh, just married, the old queen, and there's something shady going on there, but it's all a little uh, out there. But then Claudius comes in and starts to talk. And what I want you to focus on here is what he's saying. Beginnings and endings. Always look at beginnings and endings. How does Claudius begin? Again, I'm going to slow this down. That would help more if my marker worked, but though! Who starts speaking with though? Murderer. What? Murderer. Murderers, pump the brakes on that one. <laughs> I would say probably no one, because you don't start speaking with though. Though is something you say in the middle of a sentence. You know? I would really love to just walk out of here right now, though we still have some talking to do before I can leave and still justifiably accept my uh, generous paycheck at the end of the week. It's something you say in the middle. He's already, looking up there, he's already got an awful lot to say. He was saying something on his way in. This is somebody who talks a lot. It is also the middle of a thought. Like I just said, I would like to leave, though I know I have to stay. It's the middle of a thought. It's, this, it's a little linchpin in a sentence, technically, that tells you that this is somebody who is articulating something in stages, multiple stages of language. Somebody who speaks in paragraph and has semicolons verbally. Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green, and that it us be fitted our, to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe, yet, and again, this is another little conditional trip. He's saying all of this is a preamble and then going into the second one. This is a remarkably complicated mind. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we, with wisest sorrow, think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Now, I want to get to this really quick to just touch on it. Ourselves. Who is our? What? All of them? Yeah, it could be. He could be speaking of the court. Um, it is a peculiar quirk of kings, however, and royalty in general, to speak in the plural, the royal we, as we call it. If you hear the, king, the Queen of England today, she will often say that we are having a good day. We are very happy today. 
And that is because she is speaking of herself in the plural. It's an old contention of uh, uh, monarchic theory that the king has two bodies. It's a famous book where he is thought of, the monarch is thought of, as the individual and the state. Which is cool. I would like to be thought of as the state. So he refers to himself as we. It's a way of impressing upon an audience when you're standing on a bare stage of impressing upon them that you are someone to be considered. You are large. Therefore, people who say therefore have paragraphs in their head. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, here we, as twere, with, with a defeating joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth and funeral, and with dirge and marriage, in equal state, weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. He has to work up to this statement. He is saying, which everybody already knows, that yes, we got hitched. Um, but he's laying down all the reasons, making sure to qualify that yes, with, worth, with mirth in funeral, mirth is happiness during a funeral, kind of a contradiction, and with dirge in marriage, dirge is a sad song, marriage is a happy occasion. Again, conflict. He's laying out that, yes, ah, I feel bad about this, but I feel good about it too. What are you going to do? <coughs> the heart wants what it wants. Life is complicated. The point is, hold on. point is, this is a remarkably complicated speech. It's very long. It's very ornate. He is speaking in a very official manner. He is speaking in a very complicated rhetoric. He's covering his butt, making sure nobody will be whispering, as they probably are, you know, he just married the queen because she was queen, right? Um, he knows that those things are going out there. He knows that he has to calm everybody's suspicions. He knows he has to carve out a little excuse for himself. And so he's doing that verbally. What do we call this type of person? What? Eliana, did you say something? No? What do we call this type of person? It's not necessarily a bad word. Well, for some people it is. He is a politician. Not the word no. <laughs> Again, you can think of your own synonyms. I'm not going there. He is writing out a paragraph at a time in his head. He is creating excuses for his behavior within it. He is highlighting everything that everybody knows and trying to bury, where did it go? I don't know. Trying to bury the, uh, the uncomfortable parts. This is also the first speech he used to do. Yep. This is his first impression. No, this is his like, inauguration speech. Uh, I wouldn't say inauguration <laughs> speech. Uh, he has, the timeline is a little iffy. He has been very recently married. There's no concrete uh, date that, you know, this happened. Uh, technically, it would be called a coronation speech. Um, this is not officially that. 
one reason that I can say that is that he's not just talking about what concerns him. Taken to wife concerns him. But he very soon moves on. Uh, let me see, where'd it go? Um, I'm going to take it away. For that, our thanks. Puts a, puts a button on it. Your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For that, our thanks. Which is the polite way of saying, moving on. And from there, he turns to business. Now! Now follows that you know young Fortinbras, and he starts in on business. There is a young soldier leading, a, uh, leading an army that is threatening his borders. He is dealing with the affairs of state, as a king should. Now follows, and he, he attacks this subject with clarity. Now! They go through that. And now, Laertes, he has a young man, the son of his most trusted counselor, who, having come for the funeral, stayed for the wedding, now wants to go back to Paris. Paris at this time, for the English, would be considered a, uh, a playground. A place for, you know, fancy people to go and uh, be silly, waste their time a little. It's a party town. Laertes wants to go back there. He needs permission from the king. So Claudius grants that in business-like fashion. Affectionate, burying him in all of these nice terms, and moving on. Asking Polonius is the uh, is the counselor. Everything's good, 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 good. Uh, Claudius clicks through all of these topics. Now I hope I haven't spoiled the idea with the nasty word politician. But looking at this speech and the way he is going about his job. Is he a good king? Is he good at his job? Hmm. Again, uh, you are now fully deputized as an expert in Shakespeare because this is a jump ball. You can say absolutely anything. He is good at his job, he is bad at his job, he's menza menza, you know. All you have to do is back it up. Is he good at his job? Yes. I think as the looks of it, as like we're reading this, he's very complicated, like his mind is very complicated, but he's forming sentences to put it out there. I think we'll just get yeah. Because if your mind is too complicated, you can't organize your thoughts. Exactly. If your mind is too complicated, uh, you can't organize your thoughts. So, he is dealing with stuff in a fairly direct and disciplined manner. He is clicking through it. Which is a good thing, I guess. Yeah. He's... Uh, He's efficient, he's disciplined, and yes, he does speak in sentences that are complicated, he does speak in paragraphs that are fully formed. There is a logic to what he's saying and the way in which he's saying it. It's his job at this point in transition to try and calm down the populace and put on a mask of legitimacy to put to rest any questions about whether or not he should be king. He is presenting himself as king. What we need now is calm. I am going to radiate calm. And he does that. He's good at that. You can question later on eh, how legitimate it is that he should be king. 
But right now, the first impression, you don't know anything else about him at this point other than the mutterings of, you know, uh, a couple of guards in the castle. And, you know, guards on the Midnight Watch are going to be a notoriously grumpy bunch, so how much can you really trust them? Here, we're getting first-hand evidence of, if nothing else, an efficient administrator. What's next? Affairs of state, what's next? I'll deal with this, I'll deal with that, I'll deal with the other thing, and then we'll move on. He knows how to run a meeting. It's a skill. Uh, um, who do we meet next? Hmm? Yeah, Cornelius and Voltamond, they're kind of pointless. Nobody cares about them. Uh, you know, uh, they're like henchmen in a James Bond movie. They're, they're just to, you know. Laertes is the, uh, is the son of Polonius. Laertes, as I suggested, his whole job is to uh, be the son of Polonius. So we've already got a couple of uh, parallels being set up in this little story. One on stage, one off. We are told the first matter of business that he's dealing with is this guy named Fortinbras. In strong arm. Fortinbra has an army just outside the border and he's kind of threatening. And his beef with Denmark goes back to his father. His father and old Hamlet had a, uh, had a fight. They were both leading respective armies and at one point supposedly they, uh, they decided to go Mano a mano, Fortinbras died, and now young Fortinbras is out trying to get uh, some sort of restitution. And it's a little complicated and nobody really cares. But the fact is, he is out there looking to take a bite out of someone's behind because his father was killed. An angry son already on the march to enact revenge for his father's death. Then we have Laertes. Laertes is also a son. That's his job, to be Polonius's son. Polonius is the uh, chief counselor to the king. Laertes is his son. Uh, decent enough fellow, we don't know that much about him, except that the one thing we are told is that he's really anxious to get back to Paris, which, as I said, is pretty much code for, eh, I want to go party somewhere. But he's there as a son. So already, the first relationships that we're really being made aware of here are fathers and sons. Shakespeare is laying these very specifically, trying to frame the way you should understand this. Uh, I don't want to get into that. Then we have Hamlet. How do we know Hamlet is... Uh, an important character. <laughs> yeah! If you're walking into the play, you've got your little medieval playbill, and you're looking at the cover, it says Hamlet. Oh, okay. Shakespeare stole this story from earlier sources. He did that with just about everything he wrote. 
But, you know, it was a fairly obscure little story going back a ways. There had been another play by, uh, about him uh, like 20 years before, I think. But, you know, uh, it wasn't a household name. So you would expect that when Hamlet walks in, okay, geez, Claudius got this huge entry. Where's Hamlet? Where is he on the stage? He's kind of skulking off on the side. He has a snarky little comment to start off. His first line is interrupting his father-in-law, or not his father-in-law, his stepdad slash uncle, the king. <laughs> but now my cousin Hamlet and my son, again, Claudius, winding up to a long paragraph, it would seem, and Hamlet, aside, meaning talking to the audience, but it's really sort of a code for, you know, talking to himself or yeah, making a snide comment to the rabble on the, uh, the outskirts of the stage. A little more than kin and less than kind. Kin, kind, he's playing with words already. He likes puns. He likes... Uh, wit. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? The clouds still hang on you. He's this moody little guy off on the side, just sort of pouting, you know, snarky. Everybody else is walking in. Claudius is declaring his greatness. And, you know, Hamlin's just sort of off on the side. Bad mood. Clouds are hanging on. Not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. Now, when you hear that word, in the sun, feeding off of the cue, clouds, you're thinking automatically, like, oh, yeah, okay, well, it's, it's an open-air theater. Maybe there's some clouds overhead. Maybe he's standing in a little, uh, like, sharp light of sunlight there. You know, he's got a squid thing. Wants to get off stage so he can get his glasses. That's the expectation. That is a first literal reading of it. But what does the word sun also mean? Yeah, his father is in the cloud, so to speak, up at heaven, although he's... We might know that he's not necessarily there yet. I think sun is also a symbol of clarity and light. Clarity and light. He is a sign of reason. Mm -hmm. We know what reason is for the Renaissance. What does he mean quite literally also the sun, like the legitimate like heirs of the throne, he's the sun? He is the son. He is the legitimate heir to the throne. Why is he not king? Upon his father's death, he is like around 30 years old, which for that age, you know, uh, life expectancy wasn't terribly long. No modern medicine or anything like that. So, you know, if you made it into your 40s, you were, uh, you were an old man. I know that seems old to you, you little bit. <laughs> but he probably should be king. He is too much in the sun. Referencing his father, pointing out that he should be king, referencing the fact that his stepfather is now trying to address him as a father would, trying to treat him like his son. I am too much in the sun. I don't want to be your son. 